Thank you all for coming to this. Uh, are we on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm a sound guy from the past. I'll explain, first of all, where I came from and how this thing started. I, uh, my background is I was born in this little village called Worksop at the northern edge of Sherwood Forest in England. And I was adopted to this little village by my parents. Who be, oh, my dad was a steel worker and my mother drove the crane in the Second World War in the steel. And my dad was actually a foreman. He was very creative because he used to run 14 open north, open north furnaces and he could make steel faster than most people. And so in the Second World War, he wasn't allowed to go out of that place because he could make steel fast. And um, when I came along, I had to, do, like everyone probably here, had to do what your parents wanted you to do. So I followed what my dad's footsteps. I left the village and went to school in the secondary modern school. And things were changing in that time period. This is 1960, okay? Things were changing. On one side, there's these guys called rockets on their motorbikes. And there's these little kids coming in that were interested in this new music that was coming out. This blues and this soul and this stuff coming out of Liverpool and Sheffield and what have you. And it was the music. And then this radio station called Radio Luxembourg. I'd sit on the wall at 12, 13, 14 years of age with this Bush transistor radio and blast this thing out and it would be blasting it around. And you wouldn't believe it, but the radio, it would be coming in and out, in and out. I would get all upset. Why is this sound like this? Why is this, that, and the other? Anyway, I followed my dad, did the steel works. I got my degrees in iron, rolling, steel. And I was working as an operative in the, the Lemnings Continuous Bar Mill, which is a giant mill that did all these rolling of steel that we sent steel to America. We were, there were, what happened was that one day I'm... Um, We'll talk about this. How did I get the name Dinky? All right. Dinky toy. You see this, this little car in the middle? This is a Dinky toy. All right. Well, I put this engine, a jet engine with Jetex on the back of it and used to race it down the mill with all the guys who were examining it at the other end of the mill, the steel. And they'd see this car running down. Yeah, it was that Dinky again. And I would be racing this car down there and whatever until it exploded a bunch of times with that jet engine. But, you know, that's how the name came along. I know it means a little different here, and uh, if I was in Jamaica, Dinky Mini means a funeral service. But they all mean different things, you know. Anyway, that's how I got the name and, and whatever. But at that time, this is 1962, and it's before 63, I was going to these events at the Romarsh Bass. They'd have these bass that they'd cover up in the winter, the, the, the bass, and they'd put on shows. I'd go see the show with Screaming Lord Such and the Savages. Now, Nicky Hopkins played with Screaming Lord Such. A year later than I saw, Jimmy Page was the guitarist, okay, in 1963. But Screaming Lord Such was a show. He'd come on in a coffin, and he'd jump up out of the coffin, and I'd stab his bass player, rip his guts out, and run around the hall with the heart and lungs and everything in the hall. 1962, you know, Rob Zombie, look out. I mean, you know, when you look at some of the stuff that this was done in 62, so like, wow, this is great. But I could hear the guy singing. He would be singing on these pair of Selma speakers. All right, well, this is 62. Now, I said to myself, I'm doing, I'm doing things like um, fusion welding, which is welding these two coils together to make them bigger because America could draw these coils by... Um, by the dies, they use them for champion spark plugs, and we'd sell the steel to them, and we'd make them. And I'd, I'd be this character that refused in welding. Nobody had done that. I learned myself how to, from metallurgy, how me metal, what kind of alloys would crush together, and I'd learned that. And I says, oh, that's pretty cool. I write it down, and then they got me this job. But I was like in a union situation with doing piecework, and I was making more money than the damn roller in the mill the guy who was making a fortune, because I was enjoying myself making these things, 300 a shift instead of 30. Well, I got into trouble for that, so I says, oh, well, I want to do something different here. And then my dad passed away when I was 16, and this is 1962. And, 63, that's right, 63. Anyway, I'm doing metallurgy, I'm singing in a church opera, I'm singing with 300 people, and I'm singing in a church choir, 
I'm doing Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme for Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. I'm a gold boy from the Duke. I shook hands with the Duke many years later. And I was out camping, like, for instance, November 22nd in 1963. Where were you? JFK passed away and he was killed then. All right. Well, I was in the middle of the Mantua walking 50 miles with my partners and finding out that the, 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 the gentleman came up to me and, and said, um, you know, they've just shot the president in America and stuff. Now, for me, a little English boy, I never felt so sad in my life at that point. I never experienced anything that, that was weird, you know. I mean, it was very strange for me, you know. Anyway, just so you know, I'm watching this Pete Fender and the Strollers right after that and screaming Lord Such. I had to go see him. It was just one of these things. And I say to myself, this is the life, man. This is fun. This is, and it's the music. It was fun, it was entertainment, people running around, having a great old time. And I said to myself, I've got to do something about this. So I go to this thing called the Mojo Club in Sheffield. Now, this Mojo Club, um, in the back here is where you get in, and this was a house, and Peter Stringfellow lived in here. Now, this gentleman friend of Peter's, Nick Walsh, he built... Four cabinets with two 18s in each cabinet here, and two 18s here. The, these hundreds, there were these hundreds, they're from Goodman's, 91s. And there was two 18s in the back and two 18s in the front. It was incredible sound in this Irish dance hall. It was an Irish dance hall that was just incredible sound. And I said to myself, yeah, that's pretty cool. So I had met some friends and I wanted to make my own system. So I started this disc jockey thing with these friends of mine. And, and I built these cabinets with these two Goodmans in each one. And these were just a 12-inch 12, 12 range, 12 range. And I used this power amp, which is a leak, 60-watt stereo. Remember, tubes, valves, we call them in England. And, and, and also this Bellaslope 3 preamp in the middle. That thing here is another tube one. And then two of these Ger <laughs> Gerard turntables. And it was awesome. We had this place and it called the Pendulum Club. And then the, we changed it into the LBJ Club. And I packed the place. I had 500 people, too many, in when the cops came and raided us. 500 people came into the... I mean, we were just playing records. We were just having fun. But everybody loved the sound of this stuff because they could dance to it and feel it in their guts and what have you. So I said, oh, I can feel it better. So I went to this. Now, have you ever seen anything like this? This is 18 inch and f by 14 inch flat speakers in 1968, okay, made by Kef. I had four of these in a the cabinet per side with the horns on top, little horns, these little gunman's horns with a, 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 passive transis, a passive crossover set up in there. And, you know, it was amazing, amazing sound. I didn't change my amplifiers, which was the, the leak stereo. You didn't have to change that. It was just beautiful, but it was just the speakers we changed. Then, at that time, I came across these things. This is a, an AKG D12. This is my mic I used to use then. Now, if you're looking here, you're looking in here, start looking at this connection. All right, it's a cannon, but it's five pin. Five pin cannon? Remember, in them days, well, before I go to the orange, in them days, there was just connectors. They were different. If you remember in them days, there were, uh, if any of you do remember, there was no standard connectors for microphones. Look, these, are, these PG, these were what Owsley told me years ago, years later, in 69, the bear told me, these are the best connectors. You know, a tip ring sleeve for, for, for uh, low impedance. And, and, and this was our main one, is because everything at that time was high impedance. Or everything was this connector. It was a tushel connector. Tushel connectors on microphones. Sun Eiser, 1969, tushel connectors. Today they're all XLRs in it. That's original. I have a bunch of real ones from that time period. I got a whole set that I kept because this is my favourite mine. I'll tell you why later. But you'll, you'll not believe it. But it's, it, it's, it's, it's one of the best microphones in the world for dynamic. 
Okay? It's a dynamic hack. It's just it's not a condenser like any of this stuff. Anyway, I'll go back a bit. So I'll go back before I get to the microphones. So I joined this group. I left. Um, I left um, doing audio uh, disc jockeying because I was in Kiel, Germany for uh, three months with this guy called Paul Raven. You might know him as Gary Glitter, but he was a good lad at that time. He was a bad lad, but he was a good lad. He could sing, he sang the blues, and he sang soul with an Irish show band that was phenomenal. And the, and the Americans that came over to Kiel um, absolutely loved him. Remember, I'm music. I go through the music. So I, I come back from Germany. I've been a month or two in Germany. I come back and, I, and my friend Peter Stringfellow says, there's, there's a group that wants, wants somebody to help them. It's a roadie. And I said, what's a damn roadie? I had no idea what a roadie was. I says, he said, they want to look, after the, to look after the gear in this. Well, this is Fleetwood Mac equipment that I had to look after. I got this, uh, these Selma Collins, which is four 12-inch speakers, and this amplifier. Now notice it's high impedance. One, two, three, four channels. So here comes Peter Green on the guitarist. He's over there. And see that chair over there? That chair there would have that amplifier and mixer on it. And the PA speakers would be behind, would be there, like that. So he would be mixing it on stage. Four mics. Four vocal mics. There would be Peter. There would be Danny. There would be uh, Jeremy, and then Jeremy would have a keyboard player, a, key, a, a piano, and he'd, he'd put a mic on there. That was it. I wasn't mixing, I wasn't doing anything. I just repaired this stuff because I figured I knew how to do it. Well, I knew how to solder. Nobody else knew how to do that and screw the cables in. That's all I knew how to do. But I just mucked muck through that until along came this company. 1968. I'm going nuts over this amplifier called orange by this, this, this guy up here, Matt, up in Huddersfield. And I said to myself, I've got to have these made. So what I did is I had them make, for Fleetwood Mac, these amplifiers with giant transformers, six L6s and KT88s as, as tubes and stuff. Bam! Matt built them with aluminum chassis. Now, I'm touring. I'm taking this to America. I took it to America in 1968 in the winter tour, 68, 69. Get to Chicago, opened up the, the, the case, not the case, but it was a, the amplifier. It shattered. All the transformers bent, the tubes are smashed, everything's gone inside because it's an aluminum chassis. He didn't put it on a metal one or a steel, any steel one, it was aluminum. So it was all, it was all bent out of shape. Well, Matt came over, they came over from England and fixed it all. But the other thing that these guys had was large bass cabinets, and I loved them. Four 12-inch speakers in them. And these fronts here that you can see on here, you can kick them in and smash them in. They will never, these, these screens will never go out. They're incredible. They're absolutely incredible. And so I thought they were the, the greatest, but you couldn't lift the bloody things and I'm taking them around America. <laughs> and remember, for me, when I joined Fleet with Matt, it was just me. I'm doing the sound. I'm not doing the sound at that point. I'm doing the gear. I'm setting up the gear and the equipment. And that's, that's all I'm doing. I'm setting up the equipment and, ride, and driving the truck. In the truck was the... Um, it, if you've ever seen a Bedford Dormobile... Or a, or a Ford Transit. We had the Ford Transit, and I took, it was bare, it was just a van, and I went over to Boston, uh, to BEA, and got a bunch of chairs out of the BEA, so we got people, so Fleetwood Mac could sit in there, and a big, I got a piece of wood, and set up the wood, and then put all the gear behind that, and I'd be driving all over the countryside with this lot in there, and they'd be getting into trouble doing silly things like moaning out the window, and, and oh, it was unbelievable. We were one of them things. But it was all about the music. We get to a gig, and we go to the pub, and we set up and start playing. But the only thing would be those mics, and Peter would be doing it. Well, I said, "This is this is interesting." But Mick tells me, "I've just done a show in '67 before I came along in '68 for this company called Wem." Now, this company called Wem, now we changed into Transistors. 
Now, this equipment here is all columns, the same as what I just showed you with the, with the and I'm going to show you more of them, uh, but they're all columns. Now, this is Fleetwood Mac on stage in 1967 in this festival. Now, Charlie Watkins from Wem is a darling. I love the guy completely. He gets arrested for disturbing the peace. I mean, you know, it's the first thousand watt system and it blasts like crazy and, it, and nobody's ever heard anything like that. So the whole town with all these people in the back here are complaining left and right. What's all this stuff going on? So he's blasting away and he gets arrested. And there's Fleetwood Mac, the old Fleetwood Mac. This is Peter and Jeremy and Mick. And I'm not sure if it's Boyd on, on bass. It's not John. It's not John. This is, the, this is before John came along. Anyway... So, so Mick's been telling me he wants me to go to Wem. So what had happened, I'd, I bought all this orange stuff for them, uh, uh, for their back line and stuff, and it's really sweet sounding, beautiful sounding amplifiers, great stuff. But this Wem stuff, after I first heard it, I was going absolutely nuts. Now, this is Wem columns of 4x12s. This is another 4x12, but it's also got these horns in it. Just these four horns, the same kind of horns that's on, on the, there, same kind of horns, and these are 15 inch cabinets with horns on it. Now, what's with the horns? Inside that cabinet there is a passive, trans, a passive crossover for these horns, all right? And this here is a, what we call the slave. It's a 100 watt RCA amplifier, the old original RCA amplifier that was made here in America. That's only modified. Now, all this equipment that you see here is built so well, it, I mean, even to this day, a lot of it's still being used in different places. It's really amazing, but it's all built by handicapped people. Charlie built his whole company with all these handicapped people that came into the... It was the first person I ever saw that had handicapped people doing electronics, wiring cabinets, doing... He had an efficient little place, and it was just awesome. Anyway, so I talk about the microphones. Well, when I first came, it was all these... Unidyne and, and unispheres. Well, what they were, these on the end here, these are actually got XLRs in them now, but at that point they were all screwing, you'd screw the connector on it, it would be a quarter inch coming out for a high impedance. It was a pit. So I'm, I know long distances, you couldn't work with this stuff. Uh, so I understood why Peter had it on this stage. Well, I'd learned from um, working with this 409 microphone here, working with that, that it sounded great because they had no crackling. <laughs> you know, no, it's no, no long distance. You go 25 feet, we want a high impedance and it crackles, you know. So I'm saying, there's something good about that thing. It, it doesn't have a crackle, you know, and it's because it was balanced line. Well, why I show you this, this 58 and 57, they came along after from a gentleman friend of mine, Howie Harwood, out of Shure in, in, in Detroit. I'm playing with Fleetwood in Detroit in uh, Grandy Ballroom and this gentleman comes up to me and he says um, I want to introduce you to the, some new microphones and Howie Howard became my friend at that point when he turned me on to these microphones F 58s and 57s and stuff at that time in, in 1969 68, 69 it was it, it just brought him up I couldn't believe him so and I showed you the connectors so the, as you know there's no standard connection at this point, there are these XLRs here, this is XLRs were sort of new at the time, and, but the Tusho and, and the XLR was there, the Tusho was always there, and these quarter inch things, oh my goodness, but they were guitar cables. All right, so Fleetwood Mac, I want to just show you this, this is Fleetwood Mac's original, There's, you're going to see a lot of these weird schematics because uh, the schematics come up, because I don't know whether any of you guys did it, but when we were a lot younger, we just drew everything on paper little pieces of oh, envelopes and stuff, and you take them back, and you're going to see some of them. Well, this is the original chart from 1969 with the Shrine, uh, uh, Shrine uh, Auditorium. You want to play that? Give them a little that albatross one on that. No, the other one, yes. the Shrine one. Uh, I've got a little bit of albatross on it. Now, you're going to hear a bit of sound from that time period, from that particular show, from this show. Now, look, if you notice, there's Peter vocal, Danny vocal, Jeremy vocal, piano vocal, kick, snare, overhead, all right? Piano, one microphone, this microphone, in the sound hall. That's all it is, is this microphone in the sound hall on a piano. 
And because this microphone is a figure eight, it's phenomenal. We used to use them, by the way, later on with the doobies for vocals. Incredible. So I'll tell you why, because of the monitors. Oh. Anyway, while I'm talking all this stuff, remember, there's no monitors. No monitors whatsoever at this time period. Except when I got to Fillmore East. There was this guy called Bill Hanley from here. And Bill Hanley had the system in the Fillmore East. Do you want to I'll, I'll, I'll listen to just, just a little bit of from this. This is a Fairchild mixing console. And this is Fleetwood Mac Shrine 69, just a little bit of it. Um, three mics on drums. This is on Taco Bray's system. We're opening for a guy called Frank Zappa. And what I've done is I bought this for $25, this reel of tape, this big reel of tape. And I asked him if he could put it on and record it. And this is the recording from, from a fair child. Now, as you can hear this, the guys told me when I played this back to them, they're saying, oh, we didn't know you could mix. <laughs> you see, because... But you, you, you get the point how nice and, and, and it's sort of... I, this two-track, straight two-track on, on a reel-to-reel. They're saying you can mix, Dinky. I said... I'm trying my best. I'm trying to know what, what it is. Well, the thing is, at that particular point, this is 68, the, the only people who are mixing, this is Hanley's stuff. If you notice, these are all the old tech stuff, all the old old techs that we used to use and, and whatever. And this is the film wall east there. That's, that's how it was in that place. But at that particular point, there was my friend Bobby Pridden from The Who kept calling me up and says, Dinky, I've got something to endorse me with these cabinets. He says, Dinky, I want you to understand that. I says, what do you mean? He says, well, I've got these cabinets, so I'm going to start using them. We're at Fillmore, Fillmore East. This is them at the Fillmore East. And I'm saying, well, what are you going to use? He says, we're going to use them for monitors. Monitors? Yeah, because we used them monitors first time was at Fillmore East with Bill Hanley. Bill Hanley's Phil Morris, John Chester, wonderful engineer, one of my best friends, wonderful technician. Now, that's what I'm going to get into in a, minute, in a bit when I start talking about my stuff, is the people. It's all to do with the people for me and who you meet and what your speciality is in your particular field and how well you can do that particular field and stuff, you know. Well, here's Bobby's stuff here at the Who is, you don't really see much because they're all the damn smoke, but it's... It's basically is using sun monitor, sun cabinets, 2 by 15 just laid flat, facing up. I said, well, but that went when? And he says, well, that sounds good, but when doesn't have a facility to be able to mix on them? I said, it does. And uh, we all went through back and forth, and I started realizing monitors were cool. And even Peter said, it's, hey, they're pretty cool. I can hear myself for the first time, you know. So I came to Boston. This is the Velvet Underground here in Boston. And I met the engineer here in Boston, who became not only my friend, he became my best man for the wedding. Nancy and I got married here 40 years this week here in Boston. Okay. <laughs> and this one was in music well before me. She used to book in these colleges everywhere, people like Joan Byers and... Uh, people like um, this guy, she changed his name to, from, I forget his, what was his name? Uh, Taj. Taj Mahal, but he had, he had another name. Uh, he lived in Springfield and she changed his name and did all that. But uh, this guy came along called Marshall Goldberg, out of Boston here. I have to tell you, Marshall was different. And he still is different. <laughs> If you go back to 1960s, computers were nothing at that point. People were just starting to get into them and you were just starting to program them. Well, he was already programming in that time period. 
And before this, I didn't even know about him in the computers, but I knew about his sound stuff. And the sound stuff he was using, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a Bose 901. These little four and a half speakers. All right? Now, it turned me on to hear these little sound of these speakers. The quality of these little speakers and what went off, I said, there's something good here. There's really something good here. So, for my friend John McVie, who plays bass for Fleetwood Mac, Marshall built these, the old Carlson cabinet, this is one with a 12 inch in it, but he built 18 four and a half in this thing. Now, you want to hear the sound of that, it's unbelievable. Even to this day, it's unbelievable. Now, this thing here, on this side, is 12 four and a half. Marshall built these things called in Lashram, and it's really 11 four and a half, a dome and a network set in there of a, of a passive crossover setup. But the quality out of this is phenomenal. Absolutely. And, it, and we're sat here, this is a little bit later, this is 1972, uh, when we're starting to build, and this guy here is a big, big, you'll know a lot more about him in a minute. But he became, he's the engineer, a real engineer. <laughs> and what happened here is we were listening to this stuff with a, as you can see, you're probably on the floor, I don't really see it well, but it's a Macintosh C28 2 amp uh, mixer and, a, and, a, and, and the, and the power amp and stuff, all tools. Even then for us, I wanted the quality. I put a record on, I got dynamics. It was incredible. And then with this system, it was absolutely outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Now, I'll go back to the WEM. Now, Charlie Watkins built these WEM audio masters, all right? And it's, here's one channel. Now it's just got a bass control, a mid control, and this here was really just for the, in, in the reverb unit inside here. There's a reverb unit. Or there was an input, an output. You could put um, this thing in it, which is the WEM copycat echo. Now, this is a cheap loop echo. It might sound silly, but it worked. It really worked. And he had long echo, short echo, whatever echo, you know, but it worked. Anyway, this here had an input attenuator, and if you notice that black connection there is a low impedance, and this little one here is high impedance. So it had that, it had a switching cable network, and it could meter it. I mean, that was advanced in them for 69. I got three of them. I thought I was the boss having three of them things. And, <laughs> and then that's 15 channels, remember? Instead of five channels of, of old Altec, them big knobs, I got that. Ah, that was cooler, I thought. But I also got, this is what I did. Now, I have to tell you, groups work fun together when you, when you first start, start meeting them. Now, I met these guys... I'd met the birds before. I'd, I'd just done an album called Them Play On with Fleetwood Mac in, in England. And here's the thing that, that's interesting. Is I used, in the, in the car park, underneath uh, the Lanely Studios, uh, they kept saying to me, hey, Dinky, what, what are we going to do with this gong? Because this gong Mick had just got from Pasty. He w we went to Switzerland, and on our way to Switzerland, we stopped off at Pasty, and he... And they said, I can take the gong if I can lift it. I says, oh, we'll take it. No, no worries. <laughs> well, Mick is, you know, six foot four or whatever, and with his, his big lanky guy, he stood in the frame of the gong, and the gong fit in there. I says, oh, we, we'll, we'll get it in the truck, no problem. Well, we got in the truck. Well, I took it down to Delane Lee, and we put it in the garage downstairs. And I went and got three mics. One on the left, one on the side this way, on the sides, and one on the back, and there was the whole room. Hey, that's going to sound pretty cold. <laughs> this thing going back and forth. And you hear, it did. It, it blew everybody away. We were like, whoa, this is pretty cool. But we, that's the kind of stuff we were doing. We were creating every minute of the way that we could. We what, whatever. You know, we'd be playing away, playing away and down there, and all of a sudden, some friends would come down, like uh, Carlos Santana. He came in and he said, we're playing this song called Black Magic Woman. And Peter's wailing away on this Black Magic Woman song in, in there. And, we're going, and Carlos is like flipping out. So he says, could I have that song? And could, would you let me record it? And Peter says, yeah, whatever you want. You know, no problem, whatever you want to do. <laughs> so 
That's how Carlos got that, but he also played with them. And I would like to see, I'd like to hear some of them recordings. Uh, in fact, I, I, Martin Birch, I don't th- who was recording that stuff. I don't know whether he's got them still, but, um, but that, that was that. So I'm, I'm still with Fleetwood doing that, all right? Well, at that time, we've done lots of shows around the country, around the world, basically. Well, not all the world, but we've been to places like um, Finland, we got off the plane, it was like the Beatles. There was thousands of people out there. Oh, we want Albatross, which you've just heard a bit of, as our national anthem. And we're like, whoa, this is getting weirder and weirder. But it was phenomenal because they loved the group, the music. It wasn't about just having ripping the group apart like Beatles days. It was the group, the music. Even Beatles days, uh, um, it was funny to see them guys play. Because let me tell you, when you're a group and you play three shows a night, three quarters of an hour plus a show per night, seven nights a week for a month straight, you are doing incredible tightness. So when like, Beatles came back from, Eng- from, from Germany, from the, what they were doing, they were the tightest band in the country. So they just used it and used it at the right time with the change. Why I mentioned when I was at school and the rockers, it was starting to change into this thing, some nice hair, with really short hair and what have you. And that's why I did the Mojo Club, is all the mods came out. I was dancing on Ready Steady Go in 66 on my birthday, that kind of stuff. You know, I was, I was into that kind of thing. So it's all about that music and about the feeling. So I love this incredible group from America called the Birds. I really did. I love this, this sound that wasn't born to follow, the Easy Rider, the, the wonderful sounds that they had on this thing. And I, I just fell in love with it. Well, next thing I know... I get this call from a guy because I'd, I'd been, we'd, we'd worked with them with Fleetwood Mac in Chicago and they opened for, uh, we opened for them in, in Chicago and they couldn't believe what I'd done on the sound so this guy kept in touch, touch with me, Jimmy Sider. And he called me up, he says, we're coming to, to, to Germany, I'd like you to come over and, and, and work with us. I said, well, Fleetwood's not playing at this time, this is 1970 there. Uh, Peter's kind of flipped out a little and we uh, put him in hospital. Well, well, the thing is with acid, and I'll tell you this. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you this from experience of many times, of, well, not many times of dealing with Owsley and all that crowd, uh, which I just wrote a whole article on, uh, about Owsley in his passing on uh, Wolfgang's Vault's uh, Crow Day. But the whole point, and I'll tell you a bit more about that when I come to my system, but the whole point is, is that um, Owsley acid was pure. It wasn't the acid, it was what the governments or what the people would do to you in the hospital. They didn't know anything in England, but they'd give you electric shock treatment. Now, that's what they did to Peter. They fried his brain. They literally fried his brain. And it's nothing to do with acid, he was fine, he, he, they knew it, but they, this is national health, this is what they do. They, they no, you have to have this, and the next thing you know, he's gone, you know. So he'd, he's gone at that point. We, we knew that was going, going to be a whole different world then. Even though Danny was there and, and Christine had just come in, John McVie's wife at that point and this, that and the other. I felt, what an opportunity to go and play with this group, the birds that love the music. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a music fan. I, yeah, I love music. So why I brought this one up here is because I'm in Germany at this airport, hotel, three days prior to them, the rest of the group coming in, I'm with Jimmy Sider. And he says, we're thinking about buying one of your systems after we've heard that system that you have with Fleetwood Mac. I says, all right, well, this is what I want to do. <laughs> I tell them, I want to go stereo. Because when I heard that, wasn't born to follow, that Easy Rider stuff, um, I'm like freaking out at the stereo, at the, at the Leslie going around and around on the guitar of Clarence White. Absolutely flipping out. Now, I've just come from Peter Green, incredible guitarist. Danny Kerwin, incredible guitarist. Jeremy Spencer, one of the best blues slide guitarists you can, you can ever have around. I mean, I was spoiled. Eric couldn't touch us, but we used to have nights where we you go down to speakers in Eric and people like Jimi Hendrix, Eric, Buddy Miles. Jimmy would get up and play his bass. Peter would play, Jimi Hendrix on bass, that was a wild. Uh, would play uh, would play jams at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning after we'd already done. We'd go down the motorway at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning after gigs and there'd be the who in the, in the, uh, in the blue board and there'd be 
And then Keith Moon would be looking at, oh, he's playing my generation. Next thing you know, I'd kick the damn thing and the record would skip and you'd be running it. Mooney's here. And, and, and uh, this was the fun times. These were the fun times. We could get away with some of this stuff that you wouldn't believe you got away with. I, drove, I once drove through a roundabout, uh, you know, a rotary, a roundabout, took the keep left side with me, and Jeremy Spencer flipped out. He says, he's trying to kill us. He's trying to kill us. Says, that's when the next day they bought a Bentley and went out in the Bentley. I said, that's it. Yeah, that's cool. We're still cheap then, you know. But anyway, here's what I did with the birds. I wanted to go stereo. So... My first mixer, this is just the five channel web mixer. One, two, three, four, five. It was vocal, four, four vocals, and the kick drum, bass drum on the end. And then on this other side, what I'll be doing is these other two would be going into this, this box here. I'd plug them in. The, I had Wem make me this box into stereo. And what we'd do is we'd, we'd put all the mixers into here, and I could actually do two mixers up this. I could do ten channels of mono, and two five channels of stereo because I used the volume controls as pan pots. That's, oh, I want more, more of the Leslie. I'd turn it the left up or the right up depending on where I wanted it to go. Or I'd keep it up all the way and let the Leslie do its trip and just spin around and I'm going to play that bird's one in, in, in a minute and, and you'll hear a bit of that. But here's the deal. Jimmy Side and I were talking and I wanted to get some uh, monitors we're talking about monitors and oh, talking about how, how all this is put in here. So I drew all this stuff up and this is how I, I went there to Wem and Adam build it. Now, why I put Yuko on here is because later on, when I came to America with the birds, the first gig, this one's in the gig, out here in Boston, on one of these Boston park things, we're in a, one of the parks out there, I got this sound system up. Now, I mixed, and you'll see that I, I started building these multi-core cables. I mixed right in front. This is the stage, say. This is the, the audience here. I've been mixing there. Not in the back. There, even though I've got a 100-foot cable. All right? And I've been mixing there because I could run on stage and pick up cymbals, or I could run on stage and pick up a mic, or whatever, the, change the mics for acoustic set, or do whatever for the birds, you know. But that was how it was. So I, I won't mix in iron sets, I was mixing, even in stereo, with what's going on. Well, I was great sound on this one side, but that other side was dead as a doornail. <laughs> that is that first gig, right? So, it's the box had failed. So I didn't know nothing about any electronics, and I'm not going to fix this. I don't know how to do that. I'm a roadie, you know. So basically, I found this character, this music store in Boston called Wurlitzers. <laughs> now, Wurlitzers at that time on Newbury Street, they had a great department upstairs of electronics. Absolutely phenomenal. I'll get into that even more. But... Before I get to that point, I wanted to show you something totally a bit different, a bit radical. See this thing up here? That's a six-foot parabolic reflector. And in there was a 10-inch was a speaker facing it. This black thing at the top was the bullet. Now, these things are red with WEM signs on it with a black thing in there. I had two of these. 1969 doing Royal Albert Hall with B.B. King and Fleetwood Mac. I put these two up just for both just for vocals, 40 watt power amp. Now, how did I get the vocals? Well, this here, as I said, it's got an output on there for effects. Well, I connected that out, and I just used that as a separate vocal send, going into this 40 watt mixer, this, this 40 watt amplifier, and the speakers. You could hear every single voice in the Royal Albert Hall, it's crystal clear, just through that, without going through the pier. And then the music on the left, the, the, on either side, awesome. Mick Jagger comes up to me at the end of the show, he goes, Hey, he goes, I like them, I like them big tits, let's put it that way. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, I says, it goes along with your dick. <laughs> and the reason I said that is because he had a 30 foot, ex 30 foot inflatable thing that they used to use at the gigs. 
So before Fleetwood Mac finished, I, I, I did a gig at Roundhouse Chalk Farm. I took Mick, Fleet, Mick uh, Jagger's Rolling Stones inflatable member <laughs> with, with them to and stuck them up on either side of, uh, of, the, of this router thing. This thing, in fact, on, on uh, Wolfgang's Vault, which is a lot of my stuff's on Wolfgang's Vault, you can hear Peter on the Roundhouse one, you can hear him go, them things have a mind of their own, they say, and this thing's going up, and you can hear them, and they're all laughing, the audience is laughing, because it was throbbing with it, you know how they do with them inflatable guys in these car shop places, well, that's what it did, it was, it was going up there, but it's a show at that point, and I just shut it off, and I didn't have to do the show at Royal Albert Hall, it was just music that was coming out of BB, the band, Duster Bennett, Long John Baldry, all, all the friends that we had on this tour were just awesome sound, awesome uh, in there and everyone was saying it I left it in there for Janice Joplin for two days for Janice was in there after that but anyway Charlie uh, I want this other point I'm at the AES com uh, show um, in uh, San Francisco I think it was not last year year before last because I've just I've gone through a bout of cancer today I just went to um, pet, uh, pet scan and so I'm uh, I'm nuclear I've got nuclear all, all through me and what have you anyway we're out there, and my friend Mark, um, 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 Mark Dander from JBL, which you might have known, is a, is a good gentleman, good man. He, he, I'll tell you something about him in a bit, though. But first of all, Mark and I are just talking, and he said, I want to introduce you to someone. Here's, here's John Meyer. John Meyer is from Meyer Sound. And I said, hey, John, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for fixing up my, my damn parabolas. He says, no one's ever done that. I says, and I pulled him out, which he saw. That's the WEM schematic, but I have the full schematic at home of, of, the, of those parabolas with all the dips and the curves and everything that we did tested in, in an anaconic chamber and stuff. Anyway, I said, thank you. I says, all you did is damn cut a hole in the middle so the transients disappeared. Oh, I could have done that with a damn screwdriver. No problem. <laughs> But I says, you did it. Your, your idea is better than mine. That point. And he still wouldn't have it. That I didn't. And then Gander says to him, he says, you better come to my office and uh, see this. He to tells him. Because he's got the same copy that I've got of, of the Wem uh, Parabolas. You know? so, so John Mayer went through with his tail between his legs going, oh, somebody else has done it before. <laughs> but, but anyway, that, that's how it is. So here's the deal here. Here's what I built. This is the, this is the Wem sound system. As you see, there's some old... Um, Selma cabinets on top but this is the birds it's in there, it says the Mac on it but this, this is where I took to America this is how we did it these are how it's all plugged up behind the stage but the thing about this stuff is this is the theatre in the round Clarence is playing the theatre in the round and these are all the way around the, the, the theatre now <laughs> it sounded great I used to do years later South Shore Music Circus and the Cape Cod Melody Tent stuff in there in, in the 80s uh, and up until 82 when I, I sort of quit everything and went for everything in the channel just so that the punkers can have a good time, you know. Mm -hmm. But the whole point is, is if you've been in a theatre and around, Engelbert Humperdinck comes in with his monitors. It's so loud that you, I mean, 140 something nearly, I mean, I'm talking massive sound just for his monitors. We turned all the PA off and let him just use his monitors. Because I'd, I'd seen this before. I'd done it before. I'd been in trouble with this kind of stuff before with the, with the rounds and stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the next one and tell you all. Here's the birds. Now it's just monitors. Look at that. It said two Altex 10s or 12s or whatever. It's Altec. They're not JBL. JBL are hard PA speakers. These are hard PA speakers. Wem is soft, beautiful sounding mid range speakers. So here's the birds. Now you'll see these web mixers. Now you see on the top of here is this box. Now this box is called a DBX 117. Not 119, it's a 117. But it's also a prototype. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And you'll see these monitors down here on the floor. You'll see one of them just there. That's a rebel cabinet designed because of 
because uh, the, the rebel cabinets, uh, and if you've ever seen those kind of cabinets, they're a kind of a folded horn, the clip style. This is what Hanley used. He used the clip speakers, although Goodman was making them similar uh, in England. Remember, I come from the English background, not the American background. All right, so I've got all the English toys and stuff. So I use these English toys with this. This is, these are the gigs we used to do. Here in the college, we'd play the gym. We'd come in to be these road cases. Oh, no, that's a bit later. These, these road cases, full of equipment that we'd had all made up. First kind of cases, there was us and the doors. The birds and the doors were the only people that had road cases at that time. And it was phenomenal. We were the only ones with these ATA cases. But we could go and drive, and we did a lot of this, to a United Airlines aeroplane right on the tarmac, right up the plane, and put them on the plane ourselves. All these 32 cases, a 24-foot truck, full of them. A band gear, everything. Backhand the guy, didn't cost a dime. This is excess baggage. <laughs> didn't cost a dime. We'd fly around the country like that, all over the country. All over the world at that one point, until... And so we started realizing that we were filling up the plane more than anybody else. But that was done then, and it's changed. So anyway, this is the bird stage plot. And this is my 19-pair cable I made for the birds. But you'll see the stage plot here. Roger Stand, Skip Scan. Now, you'll see what I've done here is this Leslie's in stereo. And what I've done is I took good old 409s, and I taped the 409s to one side. Now, a Leslie I'm talking of has got a 10-inch speaker in it. And it's got a polystyrene a, a foam that goes around like this inside. Ooh, ooh. It's not the Leslie, the one that spins on the top. It's the, it's the guitar. Actually, it's put, made for a road piano or something like that or some kind of thing. So I put one of these on one side, one on the other side, and there's my stereo Leslie. All right? But also, clients had a guitar... Um, and I'd make that one up with another one of them 409s. And there was Roger's 12 string, which is a Fender Twin and stuff. So this is the bird setup. We would go all over the place and, and play all, all these, these gigs and stuff. And a lot of them in colleges, a lot of them. Now, when I was telling you about, um, about the equipment, all right, the, the equipment coming in, Nancy would, <laughs> and I was telling John early on, that at a gig we'd come here, we'd play the college here. All the guys would come and load in for us and load in for us and have a great time. But you couldn't get them to load out. They got the girlfriends and they were off. We've been with the group all day. We can't do that. This one would be loading up with me and there would be just me and the one other guy loading a 24-foot truck with 32 cases full of equipment and, we'd just, and then drive 500 miles. All right? Roughly 500 miles to the next gig. And we'd do this day in, day out for months at a time. In fact, for one year, I think it was, when I first joined the Birds, we only played three commercial dates, Fillmore East, um, I think it was Whiskey A Go Go, and the rest was all, um, I think one, one other one, I can't remember, the Boston, you know, maybe. But mo most of them were in colleges and, 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 and in, in um, gyms. So by 1971, I'm getting restless with the Birds. And the reason I'm getting restless, they're having a, problem, Roger's having this, uh, going on and on about stuff, even though I'm doing the birds and this, that and the other. By November of, of, of that year, CBS has got this new thing going off called, um, it was a tour with Blue Oyster Cult and then this new group called Mahavishnu Orchestra, okay, and the birds. So the birds are using their own sound system, Mahavishnu and, and uh, and I guess, uh, yeah, and Blue Oyster had their own one that they, they were coming with and they didn't want them nothing to do with the birds. So I thought, up in Maine at this college, in this gym, I wanted to test this equipment that I'd been working with. And that's, those 901s, I took a, I don't know, 16 or 20 of them up, up with me, new, more amplifiers, and that little guy, that guy there on the left there, BG, Bobby Greenberg, the head of Wurlitzer's engineering, and engineering. I took him, and, and let's, let's see what we got here. My friend, um, my friend Marshall Goldberg had quit the music business, he said, because he's going to work for a guy called Bill Gates. This is, what, 1970. 
So he's been with Bill ever since, and he lives out in, the, in, in California, but now he's sort of semi-retired and wants to go back in the sand. I told him we already stopped that in 79. But anyway, I just wanted to understand about this. We started Dawson Sound Company. I wanted to show this because this printed here is done by T.J. Lyons here, which was one of the most ancient printers in Boston at the time. And I, I've always loved this, this thing. And here is my, the company that invested in me was Folklore Productions. And Folklore was Manny Greenhill, who had Joan Byers. Bernie was to run, it, run, run part of it. Nancy worked for, for Manny. There was me, and then this guy, Hal, Hal Yanoff. Well, I, I met this guy, there's Hal Yanoff, there in the king, at Button Boutique in Brookline, on the, in the store there, it was called Button Boutique, it, it was near the head shop. <laughs> I always remember George's Folly. <laughs> but, but that's how that was. But anyway, I mean, I, we started this thing off, and I said, okay, let's, let, let's start, well, how am I going to do this? Let's design this system. Well, as I showed you before, I made that 19 pair. This is a professional uh, 20 pair, and basically it's how it's done. It's XLR, XLR, and then, it's, and then there's fold back going back on that. We never did that. We always had a separate cable because I didn't believe, myself, I didn't believe in sending signal back down where mics are. I never did. I never liked that because even though you've got all these, these individual um, strands, Oh, so it's upside down. Or whatever. Uh, where are they? The strands, you know, the, the cables here with the, uh, the different strands. You still never knew if you're going to get a, a ground going across. One little ground would screw the whole thing. So to me, I'd rather have a single separate. So I was one for having multi cores of many multi cores of different kinds. And that side, uh, um, when I started building my own stuff, I had 19 pairs, 11 pairs, 5 pairs. There were six pairs, I said, there was all kinds of different ones, and I'll tell you why. Now, I first started doing these speaker cabinets. Now, you see there's, there's, there's two cabinets here, but, uh, but the reason there's two cabinets here is because I put in a fiber case. That was my idea, putting in a fiber case. Now, this cabinet is a base cabinet. In there is four tuned, or uh, spec'd, 10-inch speakers, acoustic suspension. These cabinets are built out of Baltic birch plywood. The surround on here is all more tight. You will never get any air coming out except for the speakers. There were sealed cabinets, so it was faceted. Now, we're talking line array here, all right? Before line arrays, I mean, I'm not the first one to do line arrays. Now, these were speakers with the high end. I used 10 per cabinet of Philips domes for high end. And these monitors were eight four and a half in a rebel cabinet. Four and a half, all right? Now, notice there's no horns. There's nothing, but it's a giant damn hi-fi system. It's the largest near-field system in 1972 that was out, in 72. And this is it. These are the WEM columns. This is upside down, but these are the WEM columns that I use on one side. This, this is, you know, all the four and a halfs, and, the, and, and then on the top of that was the uh, domes and the tens, and then here was a different kind of speaker. I'll go into this a bit later, but these are horns, but these were for a future thing, and these are Carlson cabinets for a future thing. But that and that was a separate system, totally. It was a separate vocal system. I had left, right, center vocal system, left, right, rear, 5.1. Okay? I'm serious, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. See, this is where it says, look at some of the prices on this stuff, eh? Come on, Belden, e, D1000, E48, look at four and a half speakers, 350 each. Every one of those speakers were made, handmade by Roller, tuned, specked out by Dr. Bose, every single, and there was hundreds of them. We had hundreds of these things. And, and I just wanted to let you know that well, it's just with... This guy here, who started Bobby, the head engineer, he started designing this. We built everything, and I mean everything. There's Hal Yanoff wiring an amplifier. There's another guy from Wurlitzers, Andy Topeka, wiring an amplifier. Look at the trans. Look at these power, these things here. These capacitors were. I had my transformer for the power supplies built by Tilden up in New Hampshire hand-wound transformers because of these guys. Just because of these guys, it's Bobby Greenberg, 
a guy called Rene Yeager from DBX, David Blackmere from DBX. These are the, the engineers. Now, I told you, I have ideas. How to execute the ideas, I find the people. These are the people. This gentleman here was incredible. After he left me in um, quite a few years later, he, um, he went and uh, built R Jan Hammer's studio, and then he decided he wanted to go back on the road, so he became the Rolling Stones engineer, the head engineer for the Stones tech. tech. Unfortunately, he had a dark side, and poor Andy didn't make it. Um, he did a number on himself uh, here on one Halloween in Boston when he li was living here. And he just had a kid and stuff, and it was just a real sad scene. Anyway, but that's one of many. But there's myself and Andy building this. Where, if you notice, this is upside down, and this is the frame of the metal frame. It's complete steel. These things were heavy. Look, they were drilling them away with the, with the tr power transformers, the heat sinks on here with the transistors. Now, where did I get all the parts from? I used Wurlitz as, as to pay everything up, but we would go over down the street here to Kramer at 10 o'clock at night, and we'd go in there and we'd take all the stuff that they'd never could expect, all these transistors, all these resistors, everything. They couldn't believe it. So we would take it all from Kramer and the old Sega down in Boston. And this is a power amp driver. As you saw Andy working inside that amplifier, there was two drivers in there, left and, left and right driver. As you can tell, this is how we drew everything. This is, this is how it was. I wasn't the one. I'm not the guy to do it, but BG. And then later on, another engineer that you've never heard, probably heard of called Jim Aikens. Now, Jim Aikens worked at Woods Hole Oceanographic after he worked with me, and he actually, him and Dr. Bollard found this thing called the Titanic. Them guys are, you know, really into sound. I mean, he made all the programs for Alvin and put Alvin on the ocean. It was used in 409s on the ocean. I can't believe it. This is a power supply that we had to use. I'm gonna, the reason I put the power supply up there, just to show you, I believe in the, the best power supplies give you the best quality sound coming out of whatever equipment. Let's go back a bit. 1968-69 is this group called Marshall amplifiers for guitars. Jim Marshall made these amplifiers with old, old, old parts from the military, English military. They're all wonderful specs, but the, the capacitors were just the best. The sound of them. That's why Fenders and all those sounded so wonderful in those days. It's that military stuff that was in there. And, and, and they were just, just beautiful sound. That's why you got the growl out of that. The reason the orange went the opposite way and totally knew everything was crystal clear quality sound they wanted. They didn't want that <laughs> that Marshall will give you as soon as you, if you put it in there. But a 50 watt Marshall in 1968 on a 4x12 amp was one of the best sounding bass amps you've ever heard. Better to me than the B15 and stuff like that amp. It was wonderful. McVie will tell you the same thing. It was my best amplifier. That's all he tells about. Now these are the amps. Two of them in a rack. All right. This is a, an old case. What I? I. You won't believe it. They're all open architecture. No fans. No nothing on it. Right. Well, when they passed DC, it was a wonderful sight to see. Poof! A big flame of smoke. Speakers would be melting. It was be awesome. I, mean, I did that years later in, in 1996 at Red Rocks. I set fire to that system. It couldn't handle 20 cycles. No way could it handle 20 cycles. I said, you can't regulate it's 80 cycles. Forget about it. So this is the system I built. As you can see, this is one, one long columns all the way up. This day when we opened this system up, what happened was David Blackmere comes over. Again, he loves the music. And one of his groups was Pentangle. He played Pentagon on there, and the first thing he said, need more damn bass cabinets. First thing he said, even though we had this wonderful mid-range sound off this, off this thing, you wouldn't believe the mid-range sound off it. It was awesome. And the high end was superb for cymbals, and it was superb. The bass would knock you senseless. In fact, I proved it with Mar Vishnu at Orpheum here. I was not, plaster was definitely coming off the roof everywhere. <laughs> but I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But that's the basic system. All right, that we took. Now, here's the first day, and I'd like just to play that Mahavishna that a little bit. I'm going to play a bit of Mahavishna from this show. All right? Now, this was recorded, you'll see here, 
This is the show. This is the system. Now, isn't that wild? Now, look here, what's wild. I'm going to tell you. See these mixers? There is not one knob that has a dial on it. There is nothing but knobs. <laughs> if you cannot hear, I don't care. I will. That's my philosophy. If you've got to hear the sound to adjust it, you don't have to, oh, I want 3 dB here or 3 dB there, what you do in the studio. Sucks, get out of here. That is the way to do it. That's the way to do it, is use these are what we give them. Ready? Yeah, have a listen to that. Have a listen to a bit of this stuff, and you'll see what I mean. This is that system. First, no. No sound check. play you that is because here's the sound system. This is Renee Yeager, by the way. This is Spider John Kerner. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Spider John Kerner. Yeah, yeah. And there's McLaughlin playing what you just heard. Now, look where I'm sat. I'm stood here, right in front of the, the system. Not in the back of the place. This facility was, is phenomenal. It's Lennox Mass and it's the, it's the old um, theatre on the lawn there. Uh, Twilight series and here is the stage and you look up and it's all a bank now as a crazy guy what we used to do I said to, to Bernie who was running this place I said get some balloons so he got these balloons for the kids now on that field where he sat you could see the different wind currents different things you see the balloon this way or the balloon that way well I'd already played here I'd already played the year before with the WEM system with the birds. Now, from here, there's a place called Tanglewood. How many miles is it? It's probably six miles or five miles or something. Well, I'm doing birds. Do you want to be a rock and roll star? They're doing all this thing. The next thing we know, home comes ru running up on there's the policeman. Got to stop this! He's blasting out Tanglewood. They to, to, to can't hear the orchestra out there and stuff. <laughs> it's like it's like oh, what? We, we we're going that far with the WEM sound system. We know horns, the the speakers, kiddo, just solo speakers. But we managed to. This it was the same guy who was in Arlo Guthrie's thing. Obi, Obi, not uh, Officer Obi. Yeah, it was the same dude. He's trying to pull Clarence White off stage. Get it, get it, get it. We just finished. Uh, we just finished rock and roll stuff. So anyway, <laughs> well, I bring this system a year later. This is um, July. Uh, <laughs> this is July 8th or something like that. In 72. Okay. So notice there's no horns. It's just speakers. And I, and and Spider John plays crystal clear throughout the place. But it's only solo. It's not a band. All right. So when I play with Mahavishnu, there's no vocals, no nothing. It's just music. This thing lets rip. So forget about Tanglewood. We absolutely annihilated Tanglewood back then. <laughs> annihilated it. So the thing was, though, it was cool because we're on an hour before Tanglewood started because we changed the times so that we wouldn't mess them up. 
So we didn't get much trouble, even though Officer Ulrich still runs around and saying, oh, I don't that. But as you can see, Renee's doing all the testing things. These holes here are for meters, which you'll see in a minute for later. This thing in the middle is called a master mixer. Now, I would, if you notice, these mixers are just like my WEM, the glorified WEM mixers. But, and there's no faders. They're all knobs. In the center of there is a knob that's huge. That's my master control. <laughs> And, it, and this is left and right, and this is stereo. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool, but the, all these other controls were for, uh, that hadn't been filled in were for all the other sends and whatever. There's a electronics on here, there's a tape recorder, and then there's a meter back here and stuff. They're still doing all the electronics. But I had this master mixer, and there it is. And if you look, there's RMS modules and VCAs. Well, they're all DBX. Everything in there is DBX. Everything's built by DBX, and talk about quality. Um, this mixes, um, all my mixes are less than 60 dBm signal to noise ratio on all of them. All of them were just phenomenal sounding. All right. Now this over here is the master mix of the parts and all the stuff and how we did it and what have you. And here it is again, now with meters on it. Now with meters on it, but also it's got these extra controls in the top and all these on the top here. Well, that's a separate sound system, totally separate sound system. And that's my vocal system that I used. So I could use the, the channels on the EQ uh, was input attenuation. Uh, there was uh, four, three channel EQ, all, D, all D, uh, DBX EQs before they ever put them out on the market. These were the line cards before they ever made them. They weren't testing me out with, you know, with the stuff which is cool because it sounded great. As you can see in the back in here, that's how it was all wired up. It was 11 pair multi-cables all the way jumped through. And it was just a jumble of mess, but it was cool. It, was, it worked, and it worked so well. And this is the main mixer, and, the pre, and, the, and, the, and, uh, and this is how we did it. And this little mixer was for the, really for the, um, the separate vocal system. It was a separate vocal system that we put up. And then there's a, a mic preamp that we did that, that, that uh, was using Sescon transformers that I love the sound of the Sescon um, transformers. And we built this crossover network, which was all DBX. And this was all the soft limited DBX in them days. It was heavy. So this is BG looking with me, and the truck's jammed in Lennox. This is the place in Lennox. It's full with this gear. It was a heavy. Let me tell you, it was heavy. And this is the crew. So this guy here, this is Sammy Houston, Drake's descendant, Fred. Mike is still on the road with a group called um, Rush, where he's driving trucks. There's my daughter. She's the head of beta testing for TiVo right now. So we've got some intelligent kids around us. Let's put it this way. This guy, Bernie Gell, was the manager and stuff, and uh, Joan for a while as well. And uh, he runs the Ansonia building in New York now. BG. BG took off to a company that you guys know because you deal with them every day, Fluke, the, 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 the electronics. Well, BG also was a nut for fireworks. So he got in with the people out in Seattle that he, uh, where Fluke is at, the guys with the Gucci's, the fireworks, and he started doing the timing of all the fireworks, and he loved it. So he's, he, he's still doing it. And he's no longer with us. But Bob Shatner is down in South somewhere, David Gray, now, that's the guy I was telling you about. David Gray, you're going to see him again in a minute. But David was the engineer that took this concept, left, right, center, left, right, rear, and he took it to a guy at Dolby, and he's now vice president of Dolby. Because he took that concept and he said, oh, we can change it to digital, very easy. <laughs> but that's how that came about, on that one. Now, in them days, what we did... Is we, put, we these are plastic reels from for hose hoses, and this is the first one. If you notice on the mic stands, eventually I built a rack in a case. It had four of these reels. One reel was for the cables for the microphones. One reels because they're all then we started standardizing stuff with the XLRs. So we did microphone cables XLRs. We did. Um, um, speaker cables, XLRs, everything was XLR, so it was all plug plug and it was easy to do. So, use these plastic cables at that time, uh, cable things, which are the hoses for, the, for going outside in the garden. 
And, and, and that's how we did that. Now here, AC. I'm going to tell you, we built everything from scratch. We had our own AC that we built. This is the specs for the AC. 2083 phase. So here's my tail ends. Hook me into the power, Mr. Electrician. Three phase, you can do this, you can do that. And there's the network. We use these things called tweakos on two old cables and stuff like that. Now, tweakos are welding connectors. 69. Okay, connectors are changing. By the time I come around in 72, I go to Madison Square Garden and I set up, start setting up. Oh, you can't set this AC up. It's illegal now, union's telling me. And the union actually became my friend after an incident we had a year before um, in, in there. He said, no, you've got to understand, we've got to use these. And the reason they use these cam locks is because of one little thing. They're the same as Tweekos, but they put in there a little spike so it would lock. It wouldn't come out, which made sense to me. I thought it was awesome. But it was owned by the union. So you had to buy them before you even started setting your gear up and take all of them off and change them all on the spot. Now, we had a lot of problems going in halls, and you guys have, you know, you've got in the studios, and this, I, I'll tell you some studio stuff. All right, now, here we get to my monitor board. Now, I told you I did Mahavishnu Orchestra, right? Well, Mahavishnu Orchestra is a very complicated, complicated group. This is David, actually, at the Esplanade, in, when I blew out the, one of them tower windows. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it was Esplanade. Oh, the, yeah, all you need is a little bit of, a little bit of power. Well, I, I'll show you the power in a minute, but here's the deal. This here is the monitor board. Now, what's all these back here? Well, it's an incomplete monitor mixer. Even to this day, this is the one that's done a bunch of live albums and stuff. What I did is I built six, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six outputs for an individual on stage to mix their own monitors. They had headsets, it's just 72, all right? It's only a 20 channel in, but it's, tw it's, it's also 10, 16 channels out in 72, 16 channels of monitoring. I, I did, like for Jeff Beck, for instance, when I did Jeff Beck, he wanted a cabinet per send so that he could go and take his guitar and go over, to, and go over there and get feedback of a different sound and we'd work on different sounds. So he had six separate sends of monitors so you can go and it would go like that or you go like that and you didn't have to just walk across the stage and go oh, oh, oh. it was like that it was just awesome I mean we were creating crazy so these were a little bud box with six knobs on it headsets in it so you could listen in stereo or you could have two wedges behind you in, and, and like Jan had in behind you and it's in stereo so you're mixing Mixing the yarn in stereo, or this, that, and the other, and, and drums and everything around. Billy Cobham, I had so many damn mics on that. Oh, it's this one. But anyway, here's David mixing, mixing the monitors at Orleans. Now, if you notice on there, there's a headset. That headset was also a headset to communicate to me. Well, oh, there, there's me at the Esplanade. All right, and, and on top of here, there's, uh, oh, there's... <laughs> The good old faithful uh, Nakamichi tape recorder, the good old faithful Wem copycat, and then this uh, harmonizer, which is a. Uh, and then here the. Oh, I pressed the wrong button again. Oh, did it again? Well, well, well. I did this, and, and uh, there's a harmonizer. And then, if you notice just here, there's a PM1000. This is just for my two drummers, because I had two drummers. And it would go into the rest of this thing, this is with Orleans. This is my little box that would do all the headsets. But the headsets were capable, as you can see, they're capable of doing solos, doing the mixes, but also communicating back and forth. And I used a 60 watt D60 um, crown for the power for each one of the set headsets. So they were loud. These damn bears were damn loud, I'll tell you. <laughs> they were great. So here's the monitor mixer where I can mix all these different mixers out. And um, we also had outs. Uh, on here that I could go straight into to machines. I did John Byers live at Sing Sing Prison uh, in, in a, and you'll see it on PBS and we recorded that with Angus's studio stuff we took them out of there, uh, Bill Reisman's stuff and I, I took the first DBXs on the road of the old noise reductions and stuff and we took them on the that saved my butt because 
I had to get power from the electric chair, power to, to run this stuff. <laughs> Seriously, and, uh, we get in my book when I wrote my book. It, first thing that Son says is, John Baez gets electric in jail. Yeah, right. Just because I tapped in the electric chair for the power. I was going to do a movie for for the TV, and we had the lights up, and we had the movie guys, and we had the, we had all that. So, you know, you, you do that. You do that crazy. You have to be, you know, crazy to do this stuff. But I got this guy who was the electrician. He was in there for life because he killed somebody. And he was the electrician, and he hooked us in there, and he loved every minute of it. And, and it was just one of them things. But anyway, so... It, the reason that is the monitor little mixer. This is the this is what we did, and and we built this uh, monitor mixer headphone and, and a remote sub mixer. That's the sub mixer that we had for under box uh, that we built. Little off amps and stuff in there, and that's me again. At, like I said at the at the Esplanade, all being protected because there was it was a lot of people there. It was 500 plus thousand. I said there. Oh, it's upside down, but you'll see. No, how did that get upside down? I never did that. You mean, but uh, will it flip? No, it won't flip. Um, I don't know how to work. This is not my. I'm not, anyway, on the top here you see this. But you see these things called these are horns. I had these made, and these are long throw horns, 88 inches long, 41 inches wide. I had four of them made for Joan Byers, for vocals. As you see them on the top, of, this is the Esplanade on the top of the Orleans, the, the sound system in New Orleans. You see the the old, uh, yeah, the rebel monitors. But these suckers went 25 miles in one watt with no problem. <laughs> no problem. But, you see, the, the hard out, outside, because they were, they were made of fiberglass outside, but the inside were curved with wonderful wood, just shaped plywood, just, it was just wonderful wood. Crystal clear, beautiful mid-range. With them and um, those and the... These, these uh, cabinets here was an uh, awesome vocal system. And I used that NASA Coliseum. You can hear Joan Byers live from every stage and you can hear every seat in that auditorium. You could hear Joan pin like, or pin them or people like that. But it was just beautiful sound for, for people to, to uh, experience in that kind of a size hall at that time, you know. This is uh, another one, another festival we did up in New Hampshire, but I did so many of them. But as you can see, there's some old horns up on the top. The reason I'm using the horns is only for vocal PA. The music would still come out of this stuff and the vocals, but the vocals were just so crystal clear. Anyway, in the, in wherever it was in the field, it was just worth using the horn system. I learned that from Lennox and the balloons and working out there with the, the sound system and Tom Rush's sound system, which was all these, these kind of horns, uh, the old EV stuff, you know, the old EV cabinets. But a wonderful stuff. And it was because of their mixes of mine and their extra crossovers and all this. I, I was like in heaven. Oh, well, I went back the wrong way. Did I press the wrong one? I'm not a Mac guy, I'm sorry. I'm an old PC dude. So, uh, so here is where, where I'm saying again. I had all these notes, I never followed them either. All right. <laughs> Such an old fart. All right. So Orleans, we did, we did Orleans, as you can tell, at, at the Esplanade, and this is 1977. But prior to that, okay. And uh, in 74, I, I, I did a group called Steely Dan. Now, in 72, um, they opened for us, and us being, I'd just finished the sound system. I'd just done this in Lennox. We just got in a truck, and we went to Texas to start a tour with a group called the Kinks from England. And this group in San Antonio started with us for three days. They opened for us this group called Steely Dan. Now... Regardless of sound, regardless of equipment, personnel situations, Ray Davis refused anyone, you work for me, we're not going to give anybody a sound check, nobody a sound check. Ray Davis would not give them a sound check. I didn't care, but I knew 
that if I, this, this was a group, I didn't care who it was, I didn't know who they were. But these kids came along and, and they started playing this great music. I said, oh, this is pretty cool. So I started having fun mixing this stuff. Walter Becker and Danny Diaz came up to me and said to me afterwards, said, we've never heard out like this and we'd like you, you know, to, to, to keep in touch with you. Well, to cut a long story short, by, in 70, by 74, I've still got this contract with CBS with Mahavishnu Orchestra to do their stuff. And so I'm, I'm not running around chasing the world to do all these thousands of shows, although my WEM sound system was still working and going out to do colleges and this, that and the other, and Lou Reed and people like that performing, you know. But this group went and paid CBS a lot of money and bought the contract out for me, from, from CBS. And I went and started working with Steely Dan. Now, in Steely Dan days, all right, I had the, the sound system like this, but I put all these, as you can see all on here, these are beautiful cases now. They're all new cases and stuff. Well, I took this system around the world with them. And I took them, and I'd like to play that, that, that one, the last one on that, that thing. It's a Steely Dan. This is a little bit of Steely Dan in the rainbow in London, England, in 1974. Now, what do you do when you go to an auditorium? Do any of you guys play, go in auditoriums? And use auditoriums? Do you get up and you walk in the place? Oh, how are you doing? And I say something. I get up and I walk in a place like this and I'll stand to the left or the right of the centre and I'll go, whoop, whoop. See what's going on? Well, in the Rainbow, it's an old vaudeville theatre. The Rainbow, they built all these giant steps and these extra platforms. And I didn't like that because I knew I'd seen Otis Redding there when I was a kid. Seen Otis Redding and Carla Thomas on there. And, you know, it was awesome because I was like flabbergasted. I could hear everything and, and feel everything. And I, I wasn't just getting into sound then. They used the room. As, the, as, as and that's what you do. You go to Jordan Hall here, you've got to use the room. You, you know, you don't need a sound system and that stuff. But anyway, this is what happened. I took the, the, the big woods things out and I put the sound system on here and this is what was happening. And I'll play just a little bit of this Steely Dan stuff, just a little bit, so you'll hear what I was doing in 74 before I would get into the studio. I might have heard this on English radio, though, that I couldn't swear to it, but, uh... Well, this is the sound, the same system. You, you really want to get you know, all the ears to bleed, you do. All right, Dickie, uh, hit him. Well, we have it, Dick. <laughs> Give him the drone. <laughs> yeah, that's my Scottish background. Give him the drone. Uh, can you hear that psychosomatic? So the back, the back. Listen to the glove. Behind you, side of you, that way. Well, two. The reason that I put that on is because I wanted to, to hear something. Did you hear certain things like the guava hitting your back and in the back here? Eventually that became what's called Q sound. The psychosomatic sound. You guys now have this sound that you can change by the compression of MP3s. I hate them. And I'm sorry. Um, um, after this, as you heard this recording, okay, they wanted me to go in the studio. So I worked in the studio with Steely Dan. 
And the first thing we ever did was this album, I think it was Katie Lyon that, that uh, I did with him or something like that. <coughs> but um, I'm at ABC Dunhill in Los Angeles. Now let me tell you, you all engineers and stuff, that, that real engineers, the engineering of this studio absolutely sucked because we have two studios. Chaka Khan is in one studio, Steely Dan's in the other. Now they've got floating floors, they've got millions of dollars worth of this in there, but the bass, bass, all the way through, we're recording, I could pick up everything, because I was doing basic tracks for them, Steely Dan in them days. Sounds were coming through. We also was having a problem at the same time with the DBX noise reduction, um, giving us uh, hisses on the, on the hi-hat. It was... They had to fly out here and start to, to, to David to sort that out. But the bottom line was that, that the floating floors were giving so much problems and the walls were giving so much problems it was coming on every time. We couldn't cut the same time as Chaka Khan was cutting. It was impossible to work. And, and so we, we, we in fact, if, uh, then there's, you would be able to see a Moog synthesizer that's all set to fire on the wall because that's how serious it got to us. It was destroyed. We had to destroy it on the wall and leave it on the wall as a memory. But, the, but, the, 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 but that whole thing was just terribly engineered and, it, and I, we had better. And it's like when I went and did an, an album in England with uh, Lou Reed called Berlin with a guy called Bob Ezrin who was a, an incredible producer. I, I go and work with him doing the basic tracks and stuff. Across the road there's a group called Yes. And Yes is doing this incredible album. The, the problem is, is that the album was already done on their 16-track 2-inch. But they wanted more tracks, so they come into the... And they screwed the album up. Because they took the dynamics off of... The main, it was a mess. The sound of it was awful compared to the 16-track 2-inch. Remember, that's the best that's ever been made in this country, in any country. The 16-track 2-inch is the best recording stuff that you'll ever, ever hear. It really is. And get the digital. I'll go to digital in a minute, but I'm sorry, but ones and zeros don't make it for me. It, it has to be curved, uh, and, and a company here in Boston actually has done that, and it's called Cakewalk. Cakewalk is phenomenal, uh, if you really want to know. Um, just, just going on to that now while we're getting towards the end of this thing. Um, um, Cakewalk made it musical. That's why Roland came along and bought them, because they're a musical firm. Pro Tools is the worst thing you could ever hear in your life. I'm sorry, but ones and zeros on Pro Tools that you'll never get a true engineer that knows sound to work, it sucks. It absolutely sucks, but it's a standard in this world. What are we coming to? I was so... Oh, anyway, I had so much problems because they can't work on PC-based anyway. It's going to be all Mac-based on, on them Pro Tools because they can't handle the... Pre the but. You can't get more than 32 tracks on Pro Tools without it crashing, without a lot of problems. We've had 89 tracks of Who on Cakewalk with no problem whatsoever. And the sound of the Cakewalk and the new stuff that these guys have got here in Boston, the sonar, is, uh, it, it is absolutely phenomenal. I really believe that. And, and, and I'll tell you, if you want the quality of digital. But to reproduce it, all right, let's get to today and I'll, I'll close it up. But today is this, and I'm serious. You want to hear sound today? You stick one of these things. I have, we have one in, in Florida, my friend Jim Carrick's house. I, I helped reform my old friend, uh, Spanky McFall, and we've reformed Spanky and our gang, and we're just going out for fun in little bars and this, that, and the other, just, just to play for fun. I go to his house. We do a rehearsal in a room as big as this, and I'm going to tell you, I've got a 16-channel Mackie. Forget the digital one. I, I've had more problems on the road. In fact, John McVie will tell you, from just on Sunday, they just did a benefit in, in, in Hawaii for the Japanese community. They raised $1.6 million uh, for, for the community there. Willie Nelson, Michael McDonald, this, this sounds atrocious. John actually walked off stage and told the guy, saying, get it together. It's because a digital board. You can't get it together fast enough. And the quality is, if you make a mess on there, <coughs> and it farts, and because of the digital clipping, it's terrible. So, you, you know, so even John said on the last tour that Fleetwood did, he says it, they refused, uh, except for Lindsay wanted a digital board, so they compromised. Uh, 
they had one digital board and most analog, a big old analog board, and it's the only way for a true engineer. Because most shows today are not, are not musical shows, they're, they're, they're events. There are shows that you press the button on the computer. But this thing here, let me tell you, I mix it on a 16-channel racket with keyboards, drums, bass, cranking this, and the vocals are crystal clear coming out of this thing. And I'm saying to myself, wow! But you have to understand, I was doing this in 1976. I took my speakers that, we do, uh, that I got from Walter Becker that we did in the Steely Dan in the, in the Asia album, and, and a couple other albums, we had the Magna Planers, if you've ever heard of Magna Planers, Bipolar Mylar, Saran Wrap with, uh, you know, Saran Wrap, um, Bipolar Mylar with, um, what was it, refrigerator magnets that used to do the magnets. Okay, this is what I did with them. I still have a pair at home in a case, I can't believe it. Um, but what I did is I, I took them on the road with Joni Mitchell, and I put them behind her, behind the piano. Now, and this is where problems happen. I'm talking 1976. In the sound check, before the sound check, there's a piano tuner has to come in to, from the orchestra hall to tune the piano. So he comes in to tune the piano. Oh, and I say, oh, I've got that damn thing. I'm still, still going. I still have this microphone in the, in the piano. That's all I've got in the piano. I go to the mixer and turn it off. The guy flips out. Where's the ambience? What happened to the ambience? What happened to the ambience? It's, it's like trying to tune. He'd been tuning to the magna planers. They were so good. They're so good. He'd been tuning to the ambience. So I'm like, oh, okay. Here, is this what you want? He goes, oh, thank you. He tuned the piano. I says, now play something. And he played it. I says, now do you want to hear something? I turned it up and it's like, ah, oh, flipping out. It was so, so beautiful sound. I've never heard sound like that in orchestra hall like that ever. So, I'm trying to use these for monitors. Remember, the word is coloration. There is no coloration on bipolar. It's so you hear your voice, you hear what you sound like. And when you hear what you sound like, you start thinking twice about what you're doing because you're not hearing coloration. Good example is um, Dion Warwick. She would never go on stage with, without a pair of A7s on either side, even if they're not plugged in. It was just coloration to her. Even though it's physical looking, it was just one of them things, you know. But the, the idea is to have the coloration that you're used to. You're used to the speaker business, that, you know. So by 76, we, we'd gone past it. We'd gone to the point where we knew then that the artists wouldn't like the digital stuff. But I have to tell you, Dr. Bo solved that. This thing here is amazing in the digital because he's using analog bottom on this. He's using subwoofers in the speakers in the bottom, for the bottom end, there's two, two subwoofer cabinets there, and uh, they're using speakers face down, and then this here is the mid-range and high. It's unbelievable quality, but it's, it's something that you would all love because it comes in two parts, it packs away in, in the back of the, the trunk of the car, and bye-bye, and the 500 people with that, you know? <laughs> it, it changes the world. But in 1979, I realized that the entertainment business was, an ent was a business now. When I saw people dying in the audience, the audience being more anesthetized than damn groups, so to speak, you know, it was sad because now it became an event. The audience was the event, and it's changed since that day. So I moved my stuff into theaters in the round so I could do MOR, people who were, I, I really liked, Tammy Davis Jr., Sinatra, those kind of characters. And I missed, you know, that kind of, but I wanted to do them. So I did that in South Shore. Came out of South Shore, I said, dump this stuff. So I dumped it in, my, in, in the club that I actually own, the, 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 the club now is called the Channel Club in Boston. It's a car park now. And that, that uh, club was amazing because even though it was a, a rowdy club, we did do a lot of different acts from out all over the world, a lot of different, different uh, world-class acts, uh, even though a lot, lot started in the punk side. I just put all my sound system in there, and a bunch of 18s just for the reggae guys, and, and, and let it go. And people were freaking out. I had Man of War in there, just on their equipment was 145. When, they, when I turned my sound system on, I said, you're not loud enough. I turned my sound system on, and we got over the top. We were blasting windows out with no problem. 
It's like the Owsley thing. The Grateful Dead, real quick, about the, uh, before I finish here, the Grateful Dead situation with, the, with the, the wall of sound. Well, Owsley comes to see me, calls and hangs up at, wow, really, it's three o'clock in the morning after we just, just had a baby, and saying, I'm in town, I'm coming down. Well, he's doing Springfield's, Roberta Flack, tomorrow. We're doing Springfield the next night, the Grateful Dead, right? So I, he says he'll come down. Well, he came down with Jerry Garcia. I'm here mixing in the back, of, I, now I'm in the back of the auditorium, actually, the, the ice ring, because we're on an ice ring at that point with the, the old wood down and everything. So she's got uh, uh, up there an orchestra, okay? So Owsley says to me, hey, it sounds good. I says, yeah, but you know, with the vocal system and everything, it sounds real good. I says, yeah, but wait till you hear this. And I says, listen to this cello, how beautiful it sounds. And the, and the guy's doing a cello solo, and I turn it up. I turn it up, I've got the right frequency for the back ear. <laughs> ice cracked all the way around. <laughs> the whole ice. Jerry's going, can I have one of them sound systems? I want that, I want that, I want that sound system. So this is 1972. 1974 they come along to build their wall of sound. First thing I said to them, please don't use PA speakers. We're not in the PA business, we're in the music reproduction business. You guys have to understand, there's two differences here. That, that's why I came along and started this craziness called re acoustic suspension music reproduction systems because that's all I'm doing is reproducing the music not ah, ah, you know the public address get out of here and all that crap I'm doing music that's where Bose came in Dr. Bose has ripped a bunch of us off by the way though that little th thing that goes around uh, the, the coaster wave thing that was um, a guy's monitors down at uh, gave to Hartley PV and Hartley PV did the reverse engineering on it the next thing you know, Dr. Bose has got the thing and he pans it. And it's that, uh, that acoustic voice thing. We were using it for monitors with, with, with uh, guy, uh, Jack um, down in New York, Jack Weisberg, if you remember Weisberg sound, anyone, you know. Anyway, I'm going back to this and, and I'll, I'll call it an item because so, I'll bore you to tears, I'm sure. This speaker here, and the reason I said this is phenomenal. Now, I've heard these planers in an auditorium, but there's a company here called MAD, and there's American speaker and stuff that's doing this. Now, they've turned them into weapons. We were doing this in, the six, in, in, in 1972. We were turning some of this stuff that we were doing, we were going into this thing called Black Sound, which you've probably heard of. Uh, David Bowie, the idiot, gets on Johnny Carson one night, starts yatting about Black Sound, and next thing you know, there's FBI at his door saying, you do not talk about that stuff. You know? <laughs> Because, you know, they're, now, they're using black sound in the ocean to, to, to mask the submarine noise, but they're killing everything in the ocean with the sound. You know, that's what the problem is with black sound. That's, that it kills everything, but, it, uh, you know. So now it's a weapon, and now they're using it. They're using it with a gun. They're firing guns with the sound. But they're also mad as developed these incredible things like Carnival Cruise Lines now. Got, a friend of ours got them, these 12-inch flat screens, you aim them at the guys with the guys with the, the bazooka that's going to shoot you, and you just knock them out of the boat with the sound. And they go for miles, nearly two, two miles you can go with this thing. And it's the best sound thing. But they also make sound speakers. They're incredible. But again, the reason that they're doing this, the, the way they get the coloration, is they make wooden horns to put on the back of these speakers because it gets the coloration, because there's no coloration in these things. You hear the thing is so crystal clear in the auditorium. It's, it's amazing, but it's not what the music is. It's not musical enough. That's what I mean by ones and zeros with draw tools. It's not musical enough. It's, you know, harsh. So that's what they're doing. They're putting wooden horns like my wooden horn. They're using a hard outside and a soft inside to make it smooth, the sound coming out of these planers. And they're only, what, 12 feet tall or whatever. They're, they're wonderful sound, wonderful sound. You can do giant stadiums with this thing easily. And they do, <laughs> but they're not using them in sound companies because most sound companies are in debt because they've, all they're paying for is the note on all the equipment they have to get. That's what happened to me. Oh, we've got to have a new, new mixing console. I want a Neve. I want this. I want that. You know, I want a, a, a new 
council for, for, for this tour. It's just too much. So some companies were doing that. They were buying councils for these riders that were gaining so that they could work with these big groups. But it was just a jerk off from the groups. They were, whoa, we'll get all this and the stuff. And most of these companies went bust. You know, they really did. Anyway, I shouldn't be yakking too long. I'm yakking too long. But I would say, if you hear these bores, you're not going to believe the quality of what's coming out of these th things right now. Seriously, for what they are. They're, they're absolutely incredible engineering, and I'm so happy that he's actually come to the plate and done that, and, and uh, brought the best ones out. My friend Jim Carrick, the fo number one folky in Florida, will go and play in any little place. You don't need a sound system. You just put stat on there, and it's crystal clear throughout the whole place. And I, and, I, and I love that. Rather than having you blasted to smithereens like I did for, for years. <laughs> anyway, I should stop. I've been yapping long enough. And uh, any questions about anything I've rambled on about? Did you have a reference to the recorded mixes of your PA? Well, the, the recorded mixes were only for one reason. I wanted to learn... Um, if my PA was doing real well, and I wanted to learn if my mixes was doing well, to basically with the group. So sitting with the group um, every night after the concert, I would go through, to meticulously I'd go through, and they would learn, like we'd be driving, say, for instance, we'd, we'd drive somewhere and we'd put the tape on, the cassette on, and we'd listen and say, and they'd say, oh, you played that one wrong over here, you... And I said, well, is that the right echo? No, we're on this... Whatever it was, it was learning to do what I needed to do. And, and that was really the recording. It wasn't recording for uh, all for me. There are 191 of my shows up on Crod and Wolfgang's Vault. And you won't believe the quality of them. They're all cassettes. And the reason I say you won't believe the quality of them is because the gentleman that mastered them for Wolfgang's Vault, Steve Rosenthal from uh, Magic Shop in New York, Got a Grammy that year for um, restoration of a, a Woody Guthrie album. And you've got to hear some of these cassettes to what he's done to them. I'm like, how did you get that dynamics off of this? It's, it's, there's equipment out, you know. You just put it through the right gear and it comes right up. And it does. It's fascinating. So if you ever hear uh, or see Dawson sound on Wolfgang's Vault, go listen to some of them. You listen for free and you won't believe some of the mixes. There's a low remix in there of Birmingham. Um, where, you know, you can, you can feel the dynamics, you can feel the people in the audience, you can feel them here. That Steely Dan that I played from Rainbow is another one if you hear the whole thing. You, the audience, after the first number, there's barrage with sound, and, and people are absolutely like this. And they're cheering, but they're absolutely against the wall. They're, wow, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, that kind of thing. And knock them over, and then get them into the sweet spot. You get them into the sweet, so they'll listen. And we want them to listen to the music and feel the music through your toes and, 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 and all through your body. Not necessarily blasting your ears out. My vocals were crystal clear, so you didn't have to blast it out. But as you heard by that Mahavishnu, that was pretty loud out there. <laughs> were you doing sound for uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra and King Crimson when they played Cape Cod Coliseum? No, no. Um, uh, 72 was one show with them. Yeah. They went to Europe. They did other shows around. Then they went to Europe. And then they came back. And, and the next show is Yale, 1976, 19th of January, 1973. And that's up on Wolfgang's Vault now too. And it's, it's a good, it's a real good, um, it's a real good uh, show. No, I didn't do that. Did you do Rock and Roll Animal? Yeah. Certainly the Birmingham is better. Uh, show than Rock and Roll Animal. London's a better show than Rock and Roll Animal. Um, rock and Roll Animal's our band. We put them together here in Lenox, Massachusetts. And, and um, we, we spend a week out there and uh, rehearsing and doing that at Lenox Music Inn. And then we played uh, one night out there uh, before we went to Europe. And, and then we started the Europe, Europe thing with Lou. The Hippodrome was a good venue. Which one? The Hippodrome. Really. Hippodrome's phenomenal. I mean, the sound in there that I did in, in, in that, that thing absolutely blew me away. The, the free trade hall, the birds that you... Did, did I play the birds? I didn't play the birds one. Oh. There's, a, there's a birds one in here, the uh, free trade hall, Manchester. I love the sound in there. Uh, it's, it's just one of these places that 
there's something places there that, that, that I, you know, I just think it's awesome sound. My home in Sheffield, the, the round city hall, uh, uh, the Oval Hall, uh, I've had sounds in there that's outrageous over the years. Yeah, so there you go, Floyd. The, the, the Hippodrome gig, I remember particularly, because I worked for the electronic store next door to the Hippodrome, and that's also the show that Steely Dan didn't do two days that's after right. the rainbow, because Fagin got a throat thing. Well, it was, <laughs> it, it, it did, it did, but there was two levels there, there was two levels, there was, there was massive, again, with bands there's always problems. <laughs> And this, was, <laughs> and this was management problems in, in America. They were being ripped off blind in America. At the same time, Donald was having a, having a uh, hissy fit because he was getting his cold thing. We were staying at Blake's. Oh, man, talk about... Oh. I remember the stereo guitar, the intro, was just phenomenal. I mean, it was like... That's me. It was so different to, to, to what the Velvet Underground was doing. And, and, then yeah. and, was, and I remember that was the first time I ever truly experienced... I heard your parabola at the Arlo Festival, by the way, so I'm not that far behind in years, because um, that was all then. But the stereo guitars were incredible. That was the first time I'd ever heard real, like, image. Yeah, that's me. In, 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 in a I, w I didn't bring that. I was going to bring that one because it is a, a pretty amazing. Man. Like I mentioned, it's, it's really one of these amazing shows that, that we've done. Steve Hunter. Didn't Steve Hunter, Dick Wagner, Prakash, and um, and then Lou. We took Lou off the guitar for a long time and, and, and basically <laughs> stuck him in my... Well, we put him in the... He could play when he wanted to, when he wasn't too wasted. But uh, that was those days. What You, you know, you, you would... Jay Collis Brown. <laughs> now, nah, you got to laugh out of that. That's a, if you've got diarrhea like I've probably got because of the fluids I've got inside me, um, you take this stuff called J. Collis Brown, which is a tincture of opium in there, and more than one opium. We would be doing bottles of this stuff, playing music. It's one of these things that you go in left field and play music. But uh, it was a, it was an interesting time. It was a very interesting time uh, for all of us. <laughs> I'm sure you've all got stories like I have. I've got a book here that I wrote with Carter Allen. Um, oh, I did it again. What did I press? A stupid idiot. I ain't got my glasses on. I gotcha. There we go. In ninety, in nice ninety, one. yeah, it's the next to the last one. In ninety six, I nearly died. I was out with a friend of mine, uh, Chris Whitley, and I was on the road with him and another friend, Warren Zevon, because I was out with Warren, and I we just passed it. There we go. And um, I sort of, I drove 2,000 miles, hung out with Hunter Thompson in Boulder, and we would blow up, uh, I don't know what it was, we'd blow up something. He shot his cannon off in the middle of the thing. But I was out of my mind. My daughter, our daughter, uh, told me in San Francisco that I was slurring my speech. I said, I'm not doing any of them bad stuff anymore. And he says, no, you are. By the time I hit Minneapolis, um, they put me in hospital saying I got a brain tumour. I was flown, I flew right back to, to Boston to the Brigham Women's Hospital. Talk about technology. I don't know whether you guys have ever heard of an MRT machine. An MRT machine is two MRIs where a doctor stands in the middle going in your brain with virtual reality glasses on with five doctors on computers. This is real deal, 1996. And he can take the tumour out of your brain and every part of it, whereas three months later, on an original, uh, they'd have to go back in and get more out, you know. Uh, because of that. But with virtual reality glasses, the tumours turn green, you can see them green, and they pull all the stuff out. So Dr. Black said to me, he says, um, what he said to my wife here, is that um, there's nothing we can do. There's 41 people in the world diagnosed with what he's got. And we've never seen it ever here. It's called Lucoencephaly. You may have seen it recently on these TV programs. We talk about it on the TV now because it's now a big thing. Well, what it is is the myelin sheaths on my neurotransmitters are coming off. They're just like coming off like a, like a cable, multi-core cable. And they're congealing on my brainstem and I'm dying from this, this thing and it's like a Portuguese man of war attached to my brain stem. there's nothing they could do but basically the, the same the brain will heal my wife asked him if she could do complementary medicine and 
we went to acupuncture here and uh, we did do that and that saved my butt and uh, acupuncture the right vitamins the right minerals the right walking the right thing and then the next thing I get is cancer on the road but other than that I did a nine, and so while I'm doing this, Carter Allen's doing this U2 book. He says to me, Carter Allen, being the, uh, the disc jockey from WB Sane in Boston, that chases over the ZLX, and he does his blue show in the morning on a Sunday. It's an excellent show. And he, um, he said, Well, you write, I wrote 3,000 pages by hand. My wife put it into some kind of English at that point, but she's better than me writing anything. And uh, I gave it to Carter. Carter wrote this. It was, they only wanted 350,000 words for, for Billboard, and it came out on Billboard. And these are just stories. This is nothing, in, there's some sound stuff, but it's really just the stories of what I did in, uh, at certain times. A lot of stories aren't, aren't in this. I kept writing for Crow Daddy now, and they're, they're on Wolfgang's Vault too. They're, there's some teen stories, one of Owsley and the Bear, and all that's up there, with it, being doused in New Orleans and the Hells Angels driving. From the, east, from the west coast to the east coast with a bunch of stuffers the fleet were mic- on bikes and stuff Oh, amazing stories that, that only happen on the road as you know <laughs> only happen and you know <laughs> no comment. so I, I, brought, I brought some of them um, there's a few of them here but it's been out of print for a while Amazon I think has it and stuff and now with this what I've just done here and all this, this, this uh, all this um, stuff here, all, all these things. I've now put a Dawson sound book I'm going to put together with all the proper writing and all the schematics, why the schematics is done this way and why is that. Because I'll do it with the people that know the, what they're talking about <laughs> more than I in respect to those schematics and stuff. I'm, I'm just the, the, the engineer that makes the sounds, <laughs> sits behind the board and makes the sounds no matter what, what it is. I don't care whether it's a sure vocal master. <laughs> I don't care whether it's a big solid state logic. <coughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> you know I've done, I've worked them all, and, and they're all good. Uh, they've all got their own good points in the, in the boards uh, and whatever. But um, it's also the music. It's all about the music to me. It's nothing to do with. I mean, when you sing opera for nine years and stuff like that as a kid, you know, it's about music. It's not not about. Uh, it's not about sound systems, it's not about electronics, but we live in this world of electronics. You know? Anyway, I should call it tonight because I've, I've taught you here off long enough, I know. I've rambled all long enough. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed yourselves and, and it's something different. <laughs>